obvious sense. There's a huge edge to be gained by looking into things like this. With the hype, it's only going one way. He's still too cheap. How can you not love fantasy football? Hello and welcome to the Fantasy Sanctuary. We are back. We are diving into our strategy series. And I am joined by none other than Mike. You will probably know him as at Daddy's Home FF on Twitter. He's a friend of the show. I don't even know how many times this is you've been on now, Mike. Uh, he is a writer for DLF. He also writes weekly article for Trophy Smack. He is one of the brains behind the Scott Fishbowl Podathon as well. He does all the hard work behind the scenes. Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing well, buddy. I'm doing well. Finally relaxing. How are you doing? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, I, I can't imagine the uh, the level of work and the volume of work that goes into, uh, you know, putting that thing together. So hats off to you. It is, it's an incredible show. Um, yeah, certainly watched as, as much of it as I could. And yeah, what you guys do is incredible. So yeah, great stuff. And uh, today... We're here. Mike has written numerous articles about it, so I thought he is the perfect man to come on and, and talk about rebuilding. Um, so we're going to talk through some do's and don'ts, how to work out if you need to rebuild, and, and maybe some hints and tips along the way of how you should go about rebuilding. So let's kick things off, Mike. Very high level to begin with. Some kind of major do's, don'ts. Are there any things that you think if you're rebuilding, you've got to do this or avoid this at all? I, I don't know if there's any, like, you have to do one thing or another. I mean, assets fluctuate so much in this game that you're trying to build value. But the one thing that I do know is you want to be first to the start line. If somebody else beats you to starting a rebuild and someone else is already in that mode, you're going to, number one, lower the amount of assets available. And number two, you're going to lower the amount of trade partners. So what you're looking to do is really time the rebuild and take a look around your league and figure out at what point would I have the largest amount of suitors for my assets? Because that's how you're going to get peak value is to get people into a bidding war. So really the thing to avoid is holding on too long and being foolhardy and thinking that you might be a contender and letting your rec record show you what you are too late. You should be able to look around your league going into the season and know exactly where you stand compared to your competitors and get a sense for, do I have to pull the trigger on a rebuild before the season even starts rather than let the, the record dictate which way you should go. And is there... When, when you've decided you're going into rebuild, are you happy announcing to the league, right, I'm blowing it up, I'm rebuilding, come come and pick over me like vultures? Or do you try and do it, I guess, on the sly and sort of not make it quite that obvious? I definitely do it on the sly. I'm not going to make anything obvious about what I'm doing. And I'm always going to mix up the play a little bit. So I may be looking at picking up certain assets in one trade and looking to pivot a little bit in the other. One of the things you have to have a mindset of on a rebuild, it's very similar to those memes you see about success where everyone expects it to be linear, but it's actually choppy. What I'm looking to do is pick up and trade as much value as possible. So really that day trader mentality that if I see somebody who maybe is aging, that is dropping in production, that could be a value that I could flip later in the season, I'm going to do that. Because once you announce rebuild, what's going to happen is everyone's going to start throwing picks at you. That's what's going to happen. They're going to throw picks and they're going to throw underwhelming young players at you. And that may not be what you want. So if you can do it right, two things can happen. Number one, you can pick up a ton of assets that will raise the value of your overall roster. And number two, what you won't do is you won't kickstart another team into starting a rebuild, therefore dividing the suitors and lowering the actual value that you can grab. So doing it sly and doing it and mixing up your play is the best way to maximize the return you can get on your particular assets and basically monopolize that trade value for your team before others realize what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love you talking about kind of overall value and raising the value. And I think that that's key in a rebuild is you almost need to view your team as a pool of value. And that value is made up of picks and players. And, and what you're looking to do is increase that overall roster value by making trades, by making moves, so that that gets you to a point where you can compete. 
And it doesn't have to be, as you said, right, I'm only looking to build around young wide receivers, young quarterbacks and future picks. Actually, sometimes the thing you can do is, you know, take a risk, go and acquire a player that people are already casting on the scrap heap that you think could have a couple of great weeks boom, spike in value, smash, sell. You've immediately made a profit. You've raised your overall roster value on that thing. So I, I think that's a, a fantastic sort of hint and tip, should we say, to start. But I guess the question I get asked most, Mike, from whether it be listeners, whether it be people in our Discord or, or that, is how do you know when you should rebuild? And is there anything that would stop you from entering that rebuild? Sure. Uh, so when you should start, it always comes down to the league. And realistically, what can you do as a dynasty owner to compete? So the first thing that I do is I take stock of the entire league and I stack rank them. I take a look from 1 to 12. Where do I see these teams falling over a three-year window. That's always what we're talking about in Dynasty. Two to three-year windows is is where the gold is. The, the game's way too unpredictable to take a look at, oh, this guy's going to dominate the league for 10 years. I felt that way when I had Todd Gurley. I promise you it doesn't happen. Now, <laughs> right? Um, so the big thing that I do is I will make a list of the entire league, and then I will take a look at the delta between their team and mine. And what I mean by that is if I want to compete with that team what would I need to add to my roster in terms of value, in terms of talent? And I take a look at my cash of assets. That would be players that I'm not currently starting, picks that I have in the upcoming drafts. And I look at the two and I say, could I take this set of assets and turn them into what I consider to be the delta between the top teams in the league and myself? If the answer is yes, there you're not rebuilding you're actually just building. All you're doing is you're making incremental changes to get to that point. And I'm getting on the horn with my league mates, trying to pick up those players that would shrink that delta because the point is to win. That's the entire point. If I take a look, God, sorry. You were no, no, go for it. Go for it. Carry on. You're in flow. If I take a look and I say that that delta cannot be succumbed by the assets that I have, that's when I look at myself and I say, this is probably a rebuild. And this is where what I need to do is I need to take my assets that I have and I need to get a higher ceiling. I need to trade certainty for possibility because the other way to close the delta between you and the top teams is to hit on an uncertain player. So if you're talking about Let's think in terms of players to make it easier for people to understand. If you're talking about, let's say, a uh, James Conner, for example, right? Like, I, I think James Conner is the type of player that if he stays healthy, you can predict what James Conner is going to be. He's yes. steady. He comes out where he comes out. Like that's who the player is. Amari Cooper is a wide receiver is a good name to throw out there as someone who is who he is. And the floor is high, but the ceiling is low. So the, the range of possible outcomes are, are minimal. So what I'm looking at for those players is could I go for the fences? Could I pick up, Say a oh man, I don't know. I, I think so like Rashad White over James Connor, similar value, complete Perfect. opposite range of outcomes. Exactly. That's what you're looking to do is can I pick up a ceiling play? What can I do to take a swing to close that gap? And then I look at is that possible? Only if that's not possible do I look at really bringing it down to the studs in rebuilding fully because there's levels to this. When people hear rebuild, they think I'm going to drop my entire roster and have no one over 22 years old and have 175 picks. It could just mean I'm going to change my strategy from floor to ceiling. It could just mean I'm going to swing for the fence a little more and let it play out for a year because I don't like the incoming draft class or because someone got there first. All of these things come into play where you want to be strategic to maximize your assets. So I always say if you can possibly bridge the gap by swinging through the fences, go for it. You know, make that Rashad White trade. Do what you have to do 
and then see where you stand week 10 or then rip it down to the studs. If there's not possible, if you're just fooling yourself, if you really blew this roster build or this startup draft, only then am I saying I'm going to go full rebuild because it is such a difficult endeavor to pull off. And it's so hard for people to truly understand how to rebuild a roster from scratch. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the way I, I guess, term it is I say that that swing for the tenses, the fences, I call that retooling. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'm, I'm not blowing it up. I'm just being more aggressive with how I build my roster because I don't think I'm an elite contender, but I, I think I've still got enough pieces that I can, I can compete if, if things go my way. So I term that as, as my retooling. And then, as you said, there's the, the kind of, I, there's no way I can compete. Even if luck goes my way, I'm still a few pieces away. So let's look at rebuilding. If you have decided, right, I'm in rebuild mode. I've not got enough pieces to contend. I can't swing for the fences and try and take some risks to try and push me over the top. Is there anything that would prevent you from entering that rebuild? Um, I guess I'm hinting at here, if you've not got your 2024 first round pick, for example, would that stop you from rebuilding? Or if your team is absolutely trash and you've not got your 2024 pick, would you still enter that rebuild? Yeah, I'm not worried so much about having my pick or not. What I'm worried about in this particular moment is two things. Are there other rebuilds in flight? Number one, which we talked about. But number two, when will my assets hit peak value? So if we're looking at, say, and I see you casually wear a Jets shirt on the show, well played. <laughs> um, if I'm looking at Aaron Rodgers, right? Like you have a shelf life if you have Aaron Rodgers on your roster and you're not a contender to move him. We both know that he's a year-to-year -year asset. He's been flighty every offseason. So if you wait to move an Aaron Rodgers, for example, you may end up just holding a value that has no asset. Travis Kelsey is another great example of that where peak value has hit. Now, what about, say, Chris Godwin, right? Right now, we have such a question mark around Chris Godwin with Baker Mayfield and Kyle Trask under center that now is not a good time to be moving Chris Godwin. And possibly, if they're bad enough and Caleb Williams or Drake May is coming into the fold next year, that peak value would be in the offseason. So what you have to do is really be smart about the way that you play it and, again, make those value plays. So that's why I don't like two feet jumping into full rebuild, have to get it done by September 1st. That's not the way the game is played, and that's not the way life works. And the players that do that are the ones that end up in these five to seven year perpetual rebuilds because they're always trading for five seconds because they've milked every first that anyone's willing to give up off of everyone. You like to think I'm going to grab all 12 first. Number one, not every class is the 2020 draft class. And number two, not every player is willing to give up their trades. You'll be lucky to get five, right? And even if you do, you'll be lucky to hit on two. So I think what you have to do is take a look at, take stock of your team and say, hey, I'm not a competitor, but each asset has a time and a place where you should be selling them. And that has to come into play with your timing. So what you do is when you decide you're going to go into a rebuild, again, list out your whole roster and talk about pros and cons. Like, what are you looking for? If it's a tight end that has a soft tight end schedule at the beginning of the year, maybe you sell them week three. Like you talked about, if you make a trade with, for a running back in weeks eight through 12, they might take off. That's when you move them. Cam Akers at the end of the year, when he showed that he was, came back from his Achilles injury, perfect time to be moving them at that time. Or Josh Jacobs going into the playoffs next year, because now you're seeing what we saw coming, which is a contract dispute, right? There are times and places to move assets and you have to be smart and patient in doing so. And even if you're going to go full rebuild you shouldn't be doing it in a one month window you should realistically be moving pieces at their peak value picking up value and by the end of the year your portfolio should look much stronger than you started with that's what a rebuild actually is yeah absolutely and, and i love the the use of time scales there mike i think i've i've got some caught some flack shall we say in in the past because i've i've been quite staunch in my opinion that i don't think you should ever be in a rebuild for longer than a 12 month period mm -hmm. now what i'm saying is is that that's not me sitting here saying you should go from the worst roster in the league to an elite contender in a 12 month period but i think that in that 12 month period 
that should be enough for you to switch that dial of I'm in asset accumulation mode trying to build roster value to I'm now trying to build a contending roster and it might be that yeah it's two years before you're an elite contender but if after that 12 months you're starting to come out of that rebuild and on that path to contention that's what I'm talking about I don't I, I can never get my head around somebody who's sitting there going oh well I'm just accumulating picks because I'm looking to compete in three years time because these two teams are going to age out and my team will be good there. It's like, so basically you're just paying everybody else to sit there and manage a roster for three years because you think that you're not going to get there. I think that, yeah, you, you summed it up perfectly. No rebuild takes a month. I think if you're just like, right, I'm getting rid of every asset off this team. Everybody's got to go because I only want picks and young players. I think you're going to end up selling for poor value and at the wrong time and you end up diminishing your overall roster value because you're just trying to get rid of pieces but also i think if anything long if you're planning on anything longer than a 12 month window for that rebuild i think you're just wasting time and if anything you you're just kind of rebuilding for the sake of real rebuilding and and not being aggressive enough because i think that's the key is that in a rebuild you can afford to be aggressive because if you take a risk and it doesn't pay off. Worst case scenario, your, your team your team's bad. Well, you're not you're not trying to win anyway, are you? It doesn't matter. You're not going to be a contender. But if you take a risk and swing and and it pays off, boom, you know there's there's big big spike in roster value. So I I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I I really agree with what you're saying, there, Mike. Um, whilst we're here, if you're watching this and you've not subscribed. You're missing out. We, as I said, we're in we're in strategy series at the moment. We've got some fantastic stuff. Tom is absolutely killing it with some of the biggest names in the best ball industry. Um, you can also hit that follow button so that you get alerts whenever we get a new video. You can also hit the join button. You can join the Fantasy Sanctuary community from as little as 99p a month. That is about $1.25. You get access to our Discord. There's my rankings, Tom's rankings, loads and loads of content coming out that way. Um, Make sure you're hitting that like, subscribe, and join button. One of the biggest questions as well, Mike, that people ask, how how do you assess your roster? What, What are you looking at in terms of what players am I looking to sell? What players am I looking to sell at a certain point? How, how do you start with that roster assessment? Sure. So this is where realistically I'm, I'm taking a look at a few things. Number one, I'm taking a look at what is the age and longevity of my current assets? Like how did I build the team? Who are my, and I, I use color coding to keep it simple when I do my roster, who am I color coding red? Like if I end the season with these folks on my roster, I'm in big trouble because then I'm playing with fire. Then I have the people that I have are yellow. Like who are the folks that realistically have twofold? Number one, aren't the ceiling or the age that I'm looking for, but number two are too good to keep my picks from falling to the bottom. Like those, those role players, the guys we talked about, the Connors, the Amari Coopers, right. Who aren't good enough to really change the whole value of my roster and, and really shift the value of what I'm doing but are too good to keep you from the bottom. And I'm going to fall in that perpetual seventh place spot, which as we all know, is, is about as bad as you get in dynasty, right? Just missing the playoffs is as bad as you can get, unless you have a toilet bowl that you can win the first round, first overall pick, which is great. So that's what I'm looking at. And then what I take a look at is milestones and what do I want to look at? And I, I look like, and I think you touched upon it perfectly, which is over the next 12 months, I need to get from rebuilding to, to use your terminology, retooling. Like I have to get from stage one to stage two. So I'm not looking at in the first 12 months gutting, but I'm looking at saying every one of these players that are currently on my roster, number one, are not going to keep my picks from bubbling too high up. But number two, all should gain value over the course of the year. So when I term something as a sleeper, We've talked about this. People use that term way too much. I have defined it for when I use the term, and I want as many people as possible. From the moment that I do my roster evaluation to the end of that season or the beginning of the next draft, I expect their startup value to gain two full rounds. 
So I'm looking to gather as many sleepers as possible. And I'm labeling those as green. Those are not leaving my roster because that's what you want out of a rebuild. When you're rebuilding, you want those people that when you look back a year from now, you say, wow, look at the gain in value. Look at the change in value. Look at where we started and where we ended up. Those are the folks that change your rebuild and absolutely put you on the trajectory you need to get to. So that's step one. Using tools, um, honestly, you can. You, you can. This is where trade calculators can actually come in a little bit handy because you can take a look at relative value. And what you're trying to figure out is who is miscalculated. So I prefer ADP personally, like startup ADP. And what I look for is people in the same round as my assets. And I'll put little notations next to them. So, for example, in the same round, and in, in, I think you hit one that was really good. J in the same round as James Conner is Rashad White right? So that ultimately becomes a target for me. And the same round as Amari Cooper might be, and I'm just doing this off the top of my head, so don't quote me here, might be like a DJ Moore, who you might think is going to thrive in Chicago, that Justin Fields all, become, all of a sudden becomes a prolific passer and, and away we go. Or maybe it's Mark Andrews for Kyle Pitts because you believe that Atlanta is actually going to turn it around. Like those are the types of moves you're looking for. So whether it's a trade calculator or ADP, what you're looking for is value matches that you don't believe should be there. Those oddities. I put out a series. Um, I usually started around actually now, I should probably start soon, uh, <laughs> which I look through the monthly ADP and I say, here's a tra here are trades that you possibly could and definitely should make. And I list a guy that's higher in ADP than the other guy and offer straight up trades. And I say, you should make this deal now. You should make it immediately. So what I'm looking at is when I take a look in my spreadsheet and I say, here's my asset, here's my reds, and I could trade them for this person right now, offers start flying. But I use ADP and trade calculators just to sanity check myself to make sure that those values are close enough that I think I could get a deal done. And then I start firing. Shoot for like a round earlier, but settle for that, that mid round. That's the best way to use your tools. When you talk about folks on age or production, honestly, what it comes down to for me is value gain. That's all I care about. I don't care about age. I don't actually particularly care about production in the moment. I care about value gain. And what I look to do is I look to set up a way that I can, as a person setting the lineup, can minimize my wins if I still have my picks, but maximize my value without tainting the sanctity of the league. So if you have no tanking rules, what I'm looking to do is actually bet against myself and play what might be a higher rated player who has a worse matchup. But, but you know, keep it in check so you don't get called in the carpet. If your league doesn't have tanking rules, which I prefer, don't get me wrong, I would prefer that. Tank the heck out of it. Don't even put in the lineup if you don't, if you can avoid it. But pick up those players. And what you're looking for is value gain. So when you focus on a specific area, whether it be age of production, whether it be picks instead of players, you minimize your opportunity and you minimize your potential gains. So you want to cast a wide net. You want to be completely open-minded. That might mean trading for a 28-year-old wide receiver. That's just fine. I made a trade when I started the league three years back where I picked up Travis Kelsey and Tyree Kill, four young players. I think I gave up Trey Sermon was in the deal to tell you how long ago it was. <laughs> um, there were a few players in there that, that I made moves for. And everyone's like, why are you picking up old players? Well, I can tell you Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey have still been pretty darn good. Um, you know, and they've gained value as, as people have started to think that Ty, uh, Travis Kelsey is immortal. And obviously Tyree Kill's moved to Miami and what he did last year has skyrocketed his value. Those are okay moves to make. Don't think that a rebuild has to be just picks or has to be just underperforming rookies. Take a look at that wide net and get that value. But the big thing is whether it's ADP or a trade calculator, find those mismatches in value. You'll see it. Like when I look at ADP and I do that series, my eyes pop out of my head when I see two guys listed near each other. And I'm like, well, what? How the hell did that happen? Well, the way it happened is somebody in these drafts decided that player A was worth more than player B. That might be someone in your league. 
Or someone in your league might just be using that dang trade tout calculator or ADP list and think they're getting a deal. But don't set your sights on a particular player. Don't set your sights on draft picks and don't set your sights on age. Focus solely on value gain over a 12-month period, and that will expedite your rebuild so much faster than any other strategy you may use. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I think that the key thing that you said at the end there is don't value on specific players. Don't focus on those specific players and say, right, I'm rebuilding. I need to go out and acquire Drake London or I need to go out and acquire, I don't know, another young wide receiver. Because as soon as you become obsessed on players or in a specific scenario, you tend to have to end up overpaying for them mm -hmm. because you, you're in desperation mode of, I need to go and get this player. And the other person like, realizes that. And then the price goes up. If you just don't care about players, don't care about players' name, and just view them as, as you said earlier, a stock market, they are a piece of value that is either going to increase or decline. And if you can understand those peaks and troughs in value, that's how you're going to get your roster back to a position where you've got enough value that you can compete. And yeah, you know, if you think, say, for example, Cooper Cup, who's fallen significantly in the last 12 months in in adp and value yeah he's you know 30 year old receiver and you probably don't want him on a rebuild but if you think that he's going to come out gangbusters at the start of the year and suddenly be in in conversation of the overall wide receiver one from a redraft perspective well chances are his dynasty value is probably going to increase over the next three months yes it's risky but actually that could be a really sensible play because people at this time of year in the off season, nobody wants an old wide receiver. So someone might be looking to, you know, get off Cooper Cup buyback years. You can take that risk on Cup, and if he does come out and is, you know, twenty plus PPR points a game to start the year, I can guarantee you that a contender is probably going to pay more for him than you've just paid for him, and therefore you've got that gain in roster. So you've got that gain in value, and that's that's all you're looking for in this rebuild situation is that overall gain in value. So I think that's a, a valid point. When it comes to selling off assets, mm. I guess we're probably, we're, we're maybe getting into more trading theory than, than perhaps rebuilding theory, but how do you start selling? So you you talk through your traffic light system. I use a similar system. I've got a, there's a video up on the Sanctuary site probably six months ago that I did about how to assess your roster and using my double traffic light system. You've identified those players that you've said are red that you don't want on your roster moving forward. How are you going about essentially getting rid of those players? But obviously we're talking about increasing overall roster value. So you don't just want to get rid of them. You still want to get a good return for them. So how do you go about that, Mike? So this is where knowing your league mates is so important. And every article that I write, that's like the number one thing. No your league mates who at the beginning of the year is most optimistic that is your best friend uh the person who always overrates their team is your perfect trade companion i i have a guy in a league that i play with number one i love having him in the league because he's hyperactive and number two he's the most optimistic human being i've ever met and he has fallen between 101 and 103 every year for like the past six years and i've had his pick i think four of them and it's made me so happy it, it's like the fountain of youth for my teams i can't um, believe he keeps trading with you mark if that's it, the case it's my favorite thing it, it's it's my favorite because i am the i'm the talker i'm the one who will pick up the phone i'm the one who will negotiate um so that's the first step i look at you know who are the most who's overrating their team right now like who am i betting against and I take a look at, is there a package there that I want to make? Number two is I take a look at who has holes on their roster. I'm constantly looking at people who are a player or two away. And if they are, my player fits that bill. Now I'm changing the trade that I'm making from looking at picks to looking at acquiring value players that I could then move to those optimistic teams for their picks. It never has to be a one-to-one. -one. You're constantly trying to shuffle and move things around. So you're looking at each team and figuring out who stands to gain value. If there's a match, I'm making those calls. If I can convince that person that my player is their key to unlock a championship, I'm making that move at that moment. If not, 
well, we sit and wait. I, I don't think that you're taking too much risk on by letting a few weeks of the season play out. But the first thing I'm doing is I'm really doing that sales pitch. I'm, I'm complimenting their team, but I'm trying to get them convinced that without this player, they're not going to win. And with this player, they are. And I want them starting to envision what their team would look like with that player on it. And then how can I gain the maximum amount of value? If you don't know your league mates, you're flying blind and all you're looking at is names on a page. That makes it so much more difficult. But if I know there's someone that will answer my call, will work with me on a deal and through conversation, I can glean information that will help me get the maximum value. I will sit on the phone with that person for 45 minutes and let them pitch ideas back and forth. I once traded DJ Moore on a conversation that started as two seconds. The offer was laughable and I turned it into the 102. Um, that's how long the conversation took. That's how many iterations back and forth. But I knew that this person wouldn't walk away from the table. I knew I could keep pulling and pulling and pulling until I had the value that I wanted. So know your league mates, know who you can negotiate with, get on the phone with them, but set your price. Like you said, don't fixate on a player, set your price. And if you can't get your price, walk away. Because the second that your assets go for less value than you wanted them to, now your next trade becomes even more difficult. And the trade after that, because you're trying to then make up for what's a deficit that you've created. So stand strong, but know your league mates. Find out who needs a tight end, who's short on a QB, who doesn't have a running back to. Make those calls and start with them and get that value. And if you can't, leave the conversation with, well, I don't think we're matching up, but if you change your mind, give me a holler. And once their running back goes down or their tight end goes down, well, now you say, cool, well, that offer's gone. Um you're going, to, you're going to cost you a little more now because one of the things you want to set as an example is that situations change. So what you never want someone thinking is they can wait and come back to you with that same trade offer. Once their situation changes, your price goes up. What that does is not only it might get you more in that trade, but the next time you're trying to sell them a player in the preseason, they're more likely to say yes because they realize that's not a fixed asset price anymore. It's a good way to let your league mates know that you're not to be trifled with, that this is the way we're going to play the game. And that if once they become more desperate, your price goes up. That's an important fact to make sure that the microeconomics of your league change as situations change. Because otherwise, what's stopping anybody from getting a four-week free roll on their team before trading with you? It will literally hinder your ability to trade in the first month of the year. So that's what I'm playing with. That's how I'm doing it. I'm setting the scene. I'm getting my value. And if not, I'm sitting back and waiting. And once that, because everybody in your league talks, you might think they're all keeping your secrets like a locked vault. They're not. Every trade offer you send goes to four people in the league. So what do you guys think? Did you see this? And the best part is now four people know what your value is and one of them might come through with the offer. So don't just settle. Don't just offer to one person. Play the field. Spread it out. Let your team and league mates know. Okay, cool. But I'm also talking to Dave, Joe, and Linda. So if one of those three comes through, sorry. Uh, you know, I'm saying yes because you've said you're not coming to my value. So that's the game you're looking to play. You have to be that used car salesman. You have to play that game, but that's how you're going to maximize your value and stand strong. Don't just take the best offer week one. There's literally no reason to. You have plenty of time to complete this rebuild. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think selling assets is such an important thing. And I think I see it go wrong so often because I don't know if you're the same, Mike. It drives me mad when I just see people go, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm rebuilding. Five players go on the trade bait or on the trade block on, on whatever platform you're playing. And then they just sit there and like, yeah, I'm selling this person. I'm rebuilding. Come and make me offers. And it's just like you've, you've immediately lost all your leverage. It's just completely clueless. And it's like, in what world are you expecting to get the best price? If you're going to go, right, auction it off style and say right i am selling this player i will get the best pro i will sell it for the best deal on this date at this time and then you almost update the league with what the best offer is and you keep it going you almost hold that auction and get get people to outbid each other fine but don't just stick up a player on trade bait and expect that that's the best way to sell it 
if you're selling off assets, you have got to be proactive. It takes time. You have got to, as you said, Mike, you've got to speak to people. You've got to be willing to have those conversations in order to get peak value, because otherwise you're never going to get that best offer just sitting there and waiting for it to come to you. But another thing I wanted to touch on, and I kind of wanted to pick your brains a little bit, I think that when we're talking about differences in leagues and, you know, there's a, you talked about tanking earlier and there's, there's different ways that leagues determine how you get those first picks for the majority of my leagues. I don't know if you're the same, like draft order is determined by max maximum points for uh, potential points. However, you want to determine it depending on what format you're playing. My favorite thing, if I'm looking to tank or rebuild is I will sell off a couple of positions and shift that value and that asset into another position. So if I've got a starting roster of two running backs, two wide receivers, three flexes, whatever, I'll sell off all my running backs. So I've literally got no running backs on my roster. That means that running backs aren't scoring me any points on a week to week basis. That means that my max PF or my potential points is going to be lower than anyone else in the league, because rather than having 10 or 11 starters on a week, I'm only going to have eight or nine. And I've not lost roster value because I've just shifted that value from one position into another. And it's given me, you know, that same roster value and I'm essentially tanking, but I'm doing it in a slightly slow way. And I think that that's where it comes back to. If you can know your league settings, your league structure, how those draft picks are determined, it can really help you be smart about what assets to sell off in order to gain value moving forward. Absolutely. Uh, one of the easiest ways to do this, and, and you mentioned one of them, which is sell off an entire position. And I love that move if you're doing potential points. The second thing that I'll do is if I have a player who's of equal value to another player and that other player is injured, I will give somebody my player for their injured player in a second or a throw in a, a high value pick, right? Because the injured guy isn't going to make any value over the course of that year. And you're not going to gain any points. You know, perfect example would have been trading, say, Saquon Barkley for Jonathan Taylor last year, right? Like you could make that move. It's not a catastrophic injury. We're not talking about Javonta Williams where you have to see him play to know that he's going to get better. Jonathan Taylor had an ankle injury and the team wasn't winning. So they sat him out. That's the perfect player to target if you're rebuilding and your raw and your draft picks are based on potential points. He's a zero. You know he's a zero. Already done. Buying injured is the easiest way to do that. Or looking at someone who's coming into a situational change, someone who's coming up on a contract and is in a bad situation, is not scoring points because of it. There are so many ways, but looking at how can I zero out my roster without losing value, the way to do that, either position or buying injured, are the two simplest ways to do that. The third is take a look at the team and take a look at the schedule. Like, do you have someone that has a god awful schedule coming up? Those are people that you want to pick up and, you know, move somebody who's going to overperform at the end of the year. Cam Akers, we've brought up his name a lot. Not only did he have a, a great comeback, and I love the story, um, he played against some of the worst rush defense of football the end of the year. So you have to know that's coming. You have to see these soft schedules that the tight ends have. There are trends that happen through the year where you should know what defenses perform and how they perform against other positions. And you should see those peaks and valleys coming. That's a very important part of rebuilding. And if you're looking to keep your potential points down, buy tough schedules, buy injured or sell positions. Yes, yeah, so you, you're talking about buying assets. I think that's great is buy those depreciated assets. You know, you look at someone like Calvin Ridley, his, his price went from top five wide receiver to 50th wide receiver in ADP and he's back up to a top 24 wide receiver within the case of two years. Mm -hmm. If you'd have bought him as a top 50 wide receiver, well, you were almost guaranteeing that he was going to ascend in value. Yes, he's slightly older, but guess what? You can sell him now. He doesn't have to see the field and you've already doubled, if not tripled, the price you paid for him. Are there certain positions, certain 
dare we say, archetypes of players that you're looking to acquire? I know the tradition is I want to go and buy young quarterbacks, young wide receivers and draft picks. Is that what you're looking to acquire? Or, you know, we talked several times about going and buying depreciated assets that could could boom in value. Is there something that you're definitely, I must go and buy these type of players? There's nothing about the player themselves that excites me or changes anything. Um, what it comes down to is understanding the contract situation of their competition or, or their timeshare. Uh, that is what is ultimately most important to me in this game is can I pick up a current wide receiver two who's about to ascend to a wide receiver one because the person who currently occupies that role is moving on? Can I get a high value tight end who is about to ascend to a starting lineup? I'm trying to predict the future of the team. And the best way to do that is look at a person's contract situation. It is the easiest thing to do to look at, for example, a running back and find out when they're not coming back. If you thought that David Montgomery was going to be back with the Bears, if you thought Jamal Williams was coming back with the Lions, if you're looking at those situations, you don't understand how the game is played. If you're at all surprised about what happened with Josh Jacobs, Saquon Barkley, and Tony Pollard, you haven't been paying attention. If you're concerned, if you're surprised about what happened with Dalvin Cook, Ezekiel Elliott, what almost happened with Joe Mixon, those are the things that you're looking to exploit is how can I take a look at someone whose situation is going to drastically change? Perfect example right now is take a look at the Arizona Cardinals. The <laughs> Arizona Cardinals are a perfect buying opportunity because that team is going to suck. Like, and I mean suck at the beginning of the year. And depending on how bad they suck, your worst case scenario is they return with Kyler Murray as their quarterback and things go back to the watermark that they had set in previous years. Your best case scenario is they suck so bad that Caleb Williams comes to town and all of a sudden the hype around that man raises all folks and that offense explodes. Trey McBride all of a sudden becomes a can't miss tight end in people's eyes. Marquise Brown becomes a top 10 wide receiver. Like so much happens with this team where those assets are so depreciated right now. So take a look at those really awful teams and try to predict the change in scenario. You have a great draft class coming in and you have two potential stars at quarterback and Drake May and Caleb Williams, obviously in reverse order. Um, but you also have other things that are going to change situations. So what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to acquire assets who are going to explode because something is about to happen around them that is going to get Twitter talking and that's going to get ESPN talking. That is what changes the value of a player more than any performance that can happen more than any age range that could happen. All you want is buzz. All you want is change of scenario. You want headlines. Headlines dictate the value of an asset more than anything else in fantasy football. That has been the staple and a fact since social media came out. So what I'm looking to do is I'm looking at my best way to predict the future. And I'm looking to look at depreciation that has nothing to do with the player or their talent. And the perfect example right now, other than the, uh, excuse me, other than the Arizona Cardinals would be the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, the fact is two things are going to happen. Either a, the coach is going to smarten up or B the coach is going to get fired. Right, but there, there's too much happening with that offense, and those guys are too talented to be as low as they are. Whether it's Drake London or Kyle Pitts, they're both currently depreciated in value because Desmond Ritter's under center. What's he going to do? And the coach has been an unmitigated disaster, right? But if they move on from Ritter, if they're that bad, what if they're the ones to pick up Kyle Murray? All of a sudden, those assets go through the roof, right? Their situation can't get worse. The situation in Arizona can't get worse. Jamison Williams' situation can't get worse for the first six weeks. These are all things you should be looking at and saying, if I can't win, I don't care about 2023, but I know this will change in 2024. And I know Jamison Williams won't be suspended again in 2024 because what he got suspended for was foolish and really should never happen again, right? So he's more of a young Calvin Ridley situation at this point. The Falcons are, are at a make or break point with their team and with their coach. So either A, 
they get better or B, there's a drastic change, both of which will fluctuate those values. These are all things that we know for a fact have to change in the coming year. And you should be exploiting that today because you don't care about what happens in the coming year. So that's what I'm looking for. Not necessarily an age, not necessarily a position, but I'm looking for what could be a drastic change in situation that would ex have extreme value shift on the players that I'm acquiring, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think you you can that that hype machine as such is so incredible. You've only got to look at somebody. So George Pickens. So in December ADP, he was a, the forty fifth overall player in Dynasty ADP. Mm -hmm. He is currently the wide receiver forty five in ADP. He's not played any games in that span. There's not been a quarterback change. There's not been a coaching change. There's not been unless you're counting Alan Robinson, any new asset that's been added to Pittsburgh that's drastically changed the landscape for him. Yet he's gone from the 45th overall play, you know, a fourth round startup pick to the wide receiver 45. And, and you know, that could easily reverse. And suddenly he makes a great catch in training camp. There's a little bit of hype about George Pickens is Kenny Pickett's favourite target and suddenly he shoots back up in value and, and he's literally done nothing. And I think mm -hmm. that that's the amazing thing that I find with the way people assess dynasty value and, and the way people obsess about players. You know, I don't know if you saw it, uh, Mike, but the sleeper sent out a notification yesterday about Isaiah Pacheco's going to be on pup, which means he can't play for six weeks. It was oh, completely God. wrong because... Well, the puppy isn't even six weeks anymore. It's now four weeks, and mm -hmm. he could and come it off it during training camp. It was, yeah. Exactly, it was it was so wrong. But I got like four or five messages from me about people trying to buy Jarrett McKinnon and people trying to buy Ceh and stuff like that. And I was just like, annoyingly, I was asleep, so I couldn't respond and sell before Sleeper sent a, note, a retraction. But that just shows you how quickly people will react. People were willing to overpay for Jarrett McKinnon. Mm -hmm. because of one notification from sleeper that will happen time and time again if you can react to booms in value situation change whether it be buying an asset whether it be selling an asset that is how you have to view rebuilding and, and acquiring that overall roster value because i think that that's the way to go about it certainly now go on no i think and it's funny, we're going to get a little off topic here, but, but just indulge me for a second. I think this is why it's so important who you follow in Twitter. You have a lot of people that have made a following yelling buy and sell and this guy's going to be top 10 with no real backing to it. Um, but your actual valuable analysts, I guess, are the people that can quickly see those tweets and explain them. The people that can get you to pivot and do it not in a clickbait way, but in a way that is actionable advice. Like, hey, right now, this ADP is way too low because here's the factors. Very much like you just broke down with George Pickens, right? Like too many people are getting clicks off of sell George Pickens, which is what ultimately led to him being wide receiver 45 in the first place, right? That's where it came from. So three people started parroting the same three efficiency metrics and all of a sudden George Pickens does not play football. Um, that is what causes those swings. But following the right people who can both explain to you what the situation is, why it matters and what key indicators to look at to see if they are trending in the direction you expect. Those are the people that actually are worth following. Those are the people that are actually worth listening to because they're the ones that will keep you from swinging with the echo chamber. They're the ones that will keep you from going so crazy that Alvin Kamara is going to be suspended for three years and you will know, never play football again. So buy Jamal Williams. And how's that looking right now, now that he pled to a misdemeanor, right? Like there's so many people getting fat and happy off of Twitter with clickbait. And so few people that I trust to explain a situation to me in a way that I know how to take actual tangible action on. Because sell and buy in a vacuum is useless. It's not information. It's freaking noise. 
every yeah. player has value. Every player has a price that you should move them for. So just saying the words literally means nothing. I can tell you that every player in fantasy football is a buy or a sell based on your league mates. There, there's no tagging them as sells for this year and buys for this year. It legitimately rich loves Josh Jacobs for some reason and thinks what he did last year was actually what he is. So that makes Josh Jacobs a sell or Mike hates Josh Jacobs because he blocks him on Twitter, blocked him on Twitter, true story. Um, <laughs> so he'll trade you Josh Jacobs for less than he's worth because he doesn't like him. Uh, that, that player is a buyer or a sell depending on which one of us has him on our roster. And Absolutely. what you need is people to say, this guy is currently at ADP wide receiver 45. I believe by the end of the year, he's going to be at wide receiver 30. And this is why here's what I'm going off of. And here's enough information for you to decide whether I'm reading the tea leaves properly, but here's the actual tea leaves rather than some clickbait headline that that's super important to be successful in this game. In my opinion, I couldn't agree more buys and sales without a price point and reasoning is just a list of names and it drives me mad when I see buy this, sell this without those two things because it's just, it's pointless. And as you said, it is, it is complete clickbait. But um, but yeah, that, that brings us to the end of our, our conversation, Mike. It's, it's been an absolute delight chatting through with you. I hope that people have enjoyed the conversation. As I said, it's something a little bit different, something I love talking about in terms of strategy and, and kind of how to think things through and, and how to approach things. Remind everybody who's listening, who's watching, where can they find you? Where can they find your work? So you can find me at Daddy's Home FF on Twitter. I'm on DLF and on Trophy Smack. And what I will say to all the viewers, because I love Fancy Sanctuary, I love this group. Um, one of my favorite things to do is talk about this stuff. So if you're having any direct questions that I can help you with, shoot a DM. Tag me on Twitter, whatever. Uh, well, that's what we're here to do. We're here to help and follow and subscribe because these guys know what they're doing. So you'll probably get the information without having to reach out. But if I can ever help, feel free to reach out. That's what I'm here for. No, awesome. Well, I, I love chatting with you, Mike. I've, I get you on every year. I, as I said, I, I've lost count how many times you've come on now. You're one of my favorite people in the community. And genuinely, I mean this, if you're not following him, he is a phenomenal follow and a genuinely awesome guy. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we'll be back next. We have got uh, two big shows coming up. We've got a show all about the strategy behind trading and a show all about the strategy behind a startup. But we'll be back very soon. <laughs>